The elites don't want you to know this, but the ducks in the park are free. You can take them home. I have 558 ducks. The leftist control freak brain is obsessed with dominating every facet of culture. And so when I got approached a couple years ago by some great video game makers and they said, hey, we're gonna produce a video game where you take on the globalist and where you educate them with a voiceover and, 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 and where we do all these really fun things. I said, 100% I'm behind that. It was a huge success on a private platform, alexjonesgame.com. Then two weeks ago, it hit Steam and went to number one, the third largest platform in the world, the number one online platform with 150 million users. And the game has exploded since then. And it's gotten incredible media coverage. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of views of people playing the game online on all the major sites. So I want to thank the viewers. I want to thank the listeners. I want to thank everybody on X and you name it. And, and, and Jack Posobiec and Salty Cracker and all the countless people that reviewed the game, left and right, that said, hey, it's a great game. It's exciting. It's fun for making it a success. I want to thank the folks at Steam for not being cowards, even though they were under major pressure for accepting the game and putting it on their site. We're taking back the media. The left wants to dominate comedy, Hollywood, books, education, religion, everything. And it's all corporately funded, and humanity is rejecting it. So I want to invite everybody, now that the game's available on Steam, to go to alexjonesgame.com, because that gives you the sublink right to the subpage of Steam, where you can download the video game for $17.76. And if the game continues to be this successful, we're gonna launch a whole company of new video games, not just for Alex Jones, but across the board, promoting pro-human liberty visions of the future. So we've had incredible reviews. We'll play some of those in a moment. And we've had the amazing panicking by the Media Matters and the MSNBCs of the world. What does that tell you? They are scared of this art form. They are scared of you supporting it. So do what they don't want you to do and go now to alexjonesgame.com and download Alex Jones Dual Order Wars and play it and share it and promote it. Will this game save the world? No. But the spirit of resistance and what this game symbolizes will, and this will be a hell of a blow in the fight in the information war. The left claims we want to kill politicians. This is meant to go out and be able to kill. That is not our intent. Our intent is to get people to metaphysically in their minds have fun while they kill bad ideas. That's why it's a mostly peaceful video game. Get it now at alexjonesgame.com. It's New World Order Wars. I don't have any sponsors. I just love this game. And if you haven't played it, you really should. Mission complete. I have a full playthrough on this channel if you want to see what it's like. As for the Jones trial, we're on day five. Day five doesn't even have a beginning. It just starts up in the middle of another pointless deposition that focuses on Wolfgang Halbig. Then a second pointless deposition. After that, the trial really gets into the weeds. The plaintiffs bring in a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist to talk about the victim's injuries. Unfortunately, these soft-spoken weaklings really don't make any sense to me. Take this one, for example. He may look a lot like Mr. Leahy, but he's actually no fun at all. Time for a little drinky poo. Cheers, genitals. Mm, 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 mm. In fact, when I try to listen to this guy speak, all I hear is... And this little fella isn't any better. I don't know if it's my dementia acting up again, or if it's just the fact that psychiatry can sometimes be used as nothing more than weird progressive voodoo. But I was still able to pick up on the gist of the argument anyway, just by listening to the questions. These bald, elderly wackos are trying to convince this jury that hurt feelings are actually much worse than physical injuries. It's yet another huge load of malarkey. And I just don't have time for this garbage. Ain't nobody got time for that. It's only a matter of time now before some snowflake on Twitter decides to sue a troll for defamation because they got injured by a meme. So I can't take any of this seriously. And that's why we're gonna just forget day five completely and move straight to day six. All right.
Court State Tonight District Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Mike Kevin Hamill presiding. Good, Good morning. Everyone may be seated. Mr. Gall, your next witness. Please call Mr. Neil Heslin. So just a quick heads up. Mr. Heslin mumbles and even whispers at times. I have employed a new voice enhancement process to this video, but unfortunately, he's so quiet, parts of his testimony simply cannot be heard because he just didn't speak loud enough for the mic to record anything. But I have been successful at removing portions of the background noise and boosting the clarity of the audio. Mr. Heslin, if you would, introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. My name is Neil Heslin. I'm the father of Jesse McCord Lewis, killed at Sandy Hook Elementary in the school murder. December 14, 2012. Mr. Heslin, why is today so important for you? Today is very important for me, and it's been a long time coming. And I feel very good about being here today face Alex Jones, to hold him accountable for what he said and did to me, and to restore the honor and the legis legacy of my son that was tarnished by Mr. Jones. Mr. Heslin, you might have seen yesterday that Mr. Jones' attorney said that he would be here today. You might have known that it was understood that he would be here today. How does it make you feel sitting in this courtroom right now and Mr. Jones is not sitting here facing you. I think it's a disrespect, and I think it's a cowardly act of Alex Jones not to be facing me here in this courtroom. I've been here for a week and a half. My final testimony, Mr. Alex Jones does not have the courage to sit in front of me or face me on this morning. Don't worry. We'll be seeing Jones later, and as usual, it's a lot worse than you think. Very important for me to have this <coughs> trial and this testimony today. The reason to hold Alex Jones accountable, and if it was for their actions. Yes, how dare they perceive something incorrectly. Statements and the remarks and the comments made by both InfoWars and Alex Jones repeatedly have tarnished Jesse's legacy, questioning whether he died whether he's still alive. Uh, I can't even put in words how difficult it is to lose a child, regardless of that age, and under such brutal and horrific circumstances, Sandy Hook Elementary School, the massacre. I just, it's something that's sacred that shouldn't have been touched. brought into a conspiracy theory, a hoax. It just, I can't even describe the last nine and a half years of the living hell that I and others have had to endure because of the negligence and the recklessness of Alex Jones and his propaganda that he has peddled for his own profits and success. My life has been threatened. I fear for my life. I fear for my safety and my family's safety in my life. Tell us about Jesse, if you would please, about the child that Alex Jones said never existed. Jesse was six and a half years old when he was brutally murdered. He was an energetic young child, happy always wanted to help people. The hardest, biggest goal. Tell me when you first remember hearing about the man Alex Jones. I heard the name Alex Jones and I heard the, <coughs> the word or the name Info War. Early on, after the beginning of 2013, I don't recall if I actually connected both Alex Jones and InfoWars together and the statements and the comments that were being resonated by both Alex and InfoWars um, took a little bit of time to compile.
piles and put everything together. I, I, I try to ignore it, Just try to put it out of my mind, not feed into it. As time went on, it escalated quite a bit more. Um, it was a lot more out being peddled on the internet, social media platforms was being brought to my attention more often, more frequently. It was to be asked by rational and sane people, um, why people who would say these things, why, why would they in their minds believe a state that this tragedy and this murder didn't happen, and that Jesse wasn't killed by people accused, myself and the others, being crisis actors, fake, phony. It took me a long time to really understand the dynamics of it, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't explain that. I couldn't give the people an answer, short of just crazy people out there in this world. And then I, I realized that, that we have psychopaths like Alex Jones. You didn't watch or listen to Alex Jones, did you? No, I, I never listened to Alex Jones. I never followed him. I, uh, the only time I, I did watch him was when things were brought to my attention and I was, was forced to see what was being said about me, about Jesse, about the tragedy. We've been in this trial, heard about the interview that you gave to Megan Kelly. Yes. You've seen some stuff with that, and you, obviously you lived it, right? Pardon? You lived it. You gave it, it you gave an interview to Megan Kelly at her request. I did. Tell us why you did that, Mr. Heslin did that interview for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> Hopes of reaching Alex Jones and trying to get him to stop what he was saying and doing. I never attacked Alex Jones viciously or negatively. In fact, I that interview was, was around Father's Day. I believe I even wished him a happy Father's Day. And I remember thinking and stating how, how lucky Alex was. He's a very lucky man to have his children with him. And, and I hope he has them for the rest of his life. I, I would wish upon Alex or anybody the, the loss that I sustained through a child. He's very blessed to have his children, and God bless him with that. Um, I, I don't have that anymore. Before you gave this interview with Miss Kelly, did you ask Alex Jones and his show to stop with what they were doing to you? <clears throat> Did I ever ask Alex Jones to stop what he was doing? What, do, do, do you know that? Do you know that he was asked? Let me ask another way. Do you know that he was asked before this interview to stop what he was doing? I, I do know that. I, I heard that he was. Um, I personally didn't ask him before that. I never had any attempts of, or, or, or way of that I knew of um, to contact Alex Jones or or to, to reach him, to personally tell him. Um, and the way I, I really had was, was through the media. The only way to contact him was through the media? He can't be serious. How about a cease and desist letter? The real reason these conspiracy theories exist is because of the media, not in spite of it. The basic bitch media pays people like this because when you go on national television, you're gonna be seen by millions of people, so they compensate by paying out thousands or even millions of dollars. 
So uh, it seems in this case going on TV to advocate for gun control was a big mistake, especially considering what a shitstorm that conversation is. I mean, without disrespecting Mr. Heslin, take him down from the victimhood pedestal we've all been conditioned to place him on for just a second and ask yourself, how would you react to all this? Would you hire a lawyer? Or would you accept the interview with Megyn Kelly to further antagonize the situation? When no cease and desist letter came from anyone, I would guess Jones probably saw that as confirmation, or at least confirmation bias. This doesn't mean Jones was right to make incorrect claims, but it sure seems odd that everyone around these people do nothing to help them other than to enable their victimhood by focusing on Jones constantly. Instead, they should be encouraged to heal. Okay, so just another question that people are now going to be asking about Sandy Hook. The conspiracy theorists on the internet out there that have a lot of questions that are yet to get answered. I mean, you can say whatever you want about the event. That's just a fact. So there's another one. Will there be a clarification from Heslin or Megyn Kelly? I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> so now they're fueling the conspiracy theory claims. Unbelievable. We'll be right back with more. Will there be a clarification from Heslin? Sir, I would never take this moment away from you. You have the floor. Yes. Um, I did hold my son with a bullet hole in his head. Jumping head on that. Many other people saw Jesse with a bullet hole in his head. It was an open casket. Jesse had, as it states on his death certificate, he died of a gunshot wound in the head. Mr. Heslin, I'm so sorry. I just can barely hear you. Can I'm you sorry. please speak up and go closer to the microphone? I'm okay. sorry, Your Honor. Um, it's just I need, I need to be able to hear you, and I need the jury to be able to hear you, okay? I understand that, and I apologize once again. I understand that your house has been shot up, shot at. All people yell Alex Jones' name in Infowars. Is that correct? That's correct. Tell us about that, if you would, please. A few years back, my home was shot up. Vehicles were shot up in my yard. Uh, that's disturbing. Facts mm -hmm. are, this case, this trial was supposed to happen month ago to April, I guess it was, uh, and it was postponed due to the bankruptcy filings. <coughs> uh, the proximity of that time when the, this case was put on stay, somebody drove by my home yet shouting out the window, Alex Jones, and it sounded like gunfire coming from the vehicle. Alex Jones's policies or apologies are, are worthless this stage, that any apology would not be sincere, and it, it, it's come too late. His apologies in the past, uh, was one to Chobani we saw earlier in this trial, it wasn't a genuine apology. And he continuously went on, recklessly, to carnival Barker would, you know, peddle his propaganda and his lies. I don't know if Alex is even capable of a sincere apology. There's got to be a strong deterrent for Alex Jones to prevent him from peddling these, this propaganda and, and to put a stop to what's being said to me and about the tragedy and about Jesse. So an apology just won't do. I need billions in cash, please. Let's move on to the cross-examination. Good morning, Mr. Heslin. Good morning. Uh, as a father of a six-year-old myself, I am very, very sorry for your loss. Thank you. God bless you and your son, too, and your daughter. God bless you, too, sir. I have just a couple of questions, and I don't want to keep you on the stand very long. There were a, a couple of things I just wanted to, to clarify. 
was the first time you actually watched Alex Jones on a screen speaking uh, when it was brought to your attention by Lenny Posner in 2018, uh, the Owen Shoyer report? Yes, that's correct. I understand how painful this whole experience must be for you. And I respect your choice whichever way it went. Have you chosen to watch the rest of the broadcasts that we have in evidence, or have you chosen not to watch any more broadcasts? Um, I, I have watched, uh, I don't know if it's all of them, I've watched a, num a large number of numerous ones um, after it was brought to my attention by Lenny, Lenny Posner. That's no Posner's father. No, was killed too in the school shooting. Um, I I did look a little deeper into broadcast uh, clips and that, but I I never I never watched Alex Jones' show. Um, I became more aware of who Alex was, and he had a, a show or platforms or. Social media. You um, told us that during the period before, Sorry. I'd, I'd like to refer you to the period before the Megyn Kelly interview. Yes. That the period, okay. Yep. That during that period, before yep. you went on Megyn Kelly, you were generally aware of conspiracy theorists and rumors online. Is that correct? Yes and no. Um, I, I was aware of the statements, the comments, the remarks. Um, it took a little bit of time to really put it together that what the conspiracy, the conspiracy and a hoax was. Um, there was just so much of it, and it, it was all intertwined. Uh, and, and as I stated before, it, it took me a, a long time to understand the dynamics and the, the depth of the conspiracy and the hoax theory and hoaxers, which I don't even think was a word till the the, the tragedy. Uh, I think Lenny Lenny was the one that started that. Hoax, uh, hoaxers, um, but I, I was aware of, of things on the internet, the pictures, um, the Super Bowl picture that we all saw. That was uh, my recollection. That was 2013. Uh, clearly, Jesse was born in 20, 2012. I, I did see that picture, um, and I, it was floating around the internet. I, I'm not on the internet a lot. I'm not a, a with email, social media, or anything, I over the last few years I've been I became a little more up on it. Um, You've stated before that you have a, a vendetta against Alex Jones. No, I don't think I ever said that. I uh, don't think I ever said a vendetta with Alex Jones. I, I stated I. How it started this fight, um, and I'll finish this fight. Uh, but once, oh, no, I don't have a vendetta with him. Um, Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at your deposition that you gave in January of this year? I highlighted. Okay, let me go ahead. Yes, it, it says, my vendetta is with Alex Jones and what was said and done to me. And that's what's got to be set straight. My battle is with nobody but Alex and Schroyer and InfoWars. And that's correct. To your knowledge, 
before the Owen Troyer report had any InfoWars employee or Alex Jones ever mentioned your name or Scarlett Lewis's name? I don't have that answer. I feel like death is a very private event. Would you agree with that? Private and sacred, yes. And that's every death, but especially um, the death of, of a child. I kind of agree with him, yes. I, I agree with him, yes. And it's sort of Or, 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 or it should be with with Jesse's death. That wasn't possible because it was such a, a publicized tragedy and event. Um, I had a very emotional time. It was Christmas and that. And there was that, that wasn't that wasn't a possibility, unfortunately. But I, I do agree with what you said. I, I wish that was the case. Well, it could have been. But you made multiple national appearances. You could have just said, no, I have no comment. Some of these bad choices were your own. Do you find it um, disrespectful when politicians and media pundits uh, descend upon a mass tragedy and immediately use it to further political goals? Injection relevant speculation and disgusting. Disgusting because he works directly for the basic bitch media. It is not relevant, so that is sustained, and I will not respond to the rest. Do you recall going uh, back on the Megyn Kelly show uh, after this lawsuit was filed? I do. And do you recall her asking you, what do you want out of it, Neil? I vaguely remember the question, and I bet I don't clearly remember my response to it. After the <coughs> Sandy Hook school shooting, did you become an advocate for gun control? Um, it wasn't my intention. Uh, probably be viewed that way. I spoke and told Jesse's story with hopes it would prevent any future tragedies like that or school shootings. You testified before Congress, is that correct? I did, sir. In December of 2012, six days after the murder you went on CNN and spoke to Piers Morgan, true? Uh, in that time, approximately, I don't recall the exact date, but yes, I, I did. Uh, a month later, you testified before the Connecticut state government, correct? I did. A couple days later, you went on, C this is end of January 2013, you went on CNN again. Refresh my memory on how to cool that one for Would have been with Senator Chris Murphy, again with Piers Morgan discussing the Second Amendment. I don't recall that, but I, I do recall going on. I was on CNN after you know the initial Piers Morgan. But I honestly don't recall the date or that, particularly with Chris Murphy or you recall in February going on uh, CBS after you testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee? I don't really, re I don't recall, no. A month later, do you recall coming out in the New York Daily News at a press, car press conference regarding politicians? I don't recall it. 
that same month in March of 2013, do you recall appearing on CNN The Lead and being interviewed by Jake Tapper? I remember an interview with Jake Tapper, correct? That's a lot of public appearances for someone who claims he wanted to keep everything private and sacred. I just don't buy it. You testified earlier, I believe, on direct, that after this trial was delayed in April of this year, somebody shot at your house while yelling the name Alex Jones and Infowars. Do you recall that testimony? That's incorrect, sir. Okay. Changing the words with that. That's not truthful. Well, you tell me what it is. What I said was, I don't know the exact, you probably know when the, the trial was, it was in April, correct? When it was supposed to go forward before? Um, but at that point, yes, somebody drove by yelling Alex Jones and uh, what it sounded like gunfire coming from the car where they were shooting or where, whatever. No, I didn't state it was shot at my house at that point, no. So your, your testimony is that after the trial was continued in April, you heard somebody yelling Alex Jones and heard what you thought to be gunfire? Correct, that's what I stated. I didn't state it was shot at my house at that time. That's, uh, that's not truthful. Would you agree with me that at the time of your deposition in January, three months before April, you had already stated that you'd been shot at him? That's a correct statement. How many times do you claim that you've been shot at? There was that one incident that I'm aware of where my home was shot up in a vehicle. I'm not aware of any other time. It's short of what I stated about in April. And I wasn't shot at in April. I just want to make that clear. And I, I stated what sounded to be, it sounded like gunfire. You'd agree with me that that's a crime? What? You would agree that that's a crime? I totally do agree with you. And certainly if somebody shot at your house and shot at your car, that would be a crime as well? Would be, sir. A crime that would result in a police investigation. True? I reached out to the police. Do you know Detective Jewess? Pardon? Detective Jewess? I do know him. He testified here the first day. Do you recall That's that? That's correct. I remember that. Do you recall his testimony that he hadn't produced or knew of any police reports reflecting harassment by anyone other than Wolfgang Halbig? I remember that. But I will add to that that he was aware of that incident at my home. So then the plaintiffs try to make that last question seem dishonest by pointing out that Detective Jewett's was retired when the shooting happened. Detective Dan Jewett's, do you recall this testimony, sir? I do. Do you remember when Detective Dan Jewett's told us that he retired a year ago? I do. So the Detective Dan Jewess wouldn't have been someone who would have been involved with those reports that you were just asked about, as though it didn't happen, right? That's correct. But I believe the point is that they never laid any foundation for that, and it went completely unproven by any police report or testimony. So I'm not sure how this makes the defense dishonest. Thank you, Mr. Heslin. I don't have any other questions. Mr. Heslin, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'll just ask you to listen carefully to them and answer them to the best of your ability for the jury, okay? All right, make sure you speak up. You're very soft-spoken. Is the amount being asked for compensation and punitive damages by your family and lawyers meant to prevent Alex Jones from being in business after this case, or do you hope he can still operate as long as he takes it as a learning lesson? I hope he could still operate and be successful. I take it as a learning experience. When did you first meet and start interacting with Detective Jewess? Detective Jewess, I met through the uh, tragedy and the investigation uh, at Sandy Hook. He was the lead detective, and he testified to uh, 
the actual date I I met him, I, I don't recall that. It was sometime shortly after the tragedy. When did you first start therapy with Dr. Crouch? Published in 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, best of my memory, it was in the summertime. Did you ever try to contact Mr. Jones directly? No, I never did try to contact Alex Jones directly. Is it fair to say that gun control and takeaway guns are two completely separate arguments and they are not equivalent of each other? That's a very good question. Um, I, I believe that's a true statement. There's a, a difference between gun control and there's a difference between taking away guns and, and people's Second Amendment. The defense attempted to put the words blood feud in your mouth. Do you think this is reckless, given your history with their clients? I think it was a poor choice of words in, in my deposition. I should have had uh, a better choice of words. I apologize uh, for that. It was a poor choice of words, and uh, as I, to be clear, and stated before, my only business is just to settle the business with Alex Jones uh, through the legal proceedings in the courtroom. Uh, I wish him, Alex Jones uh, no physical harm or more than that, just accountability and responsibility. Uh, I don't think he understood the question, but he sure is well trained on how to do a leftist apology. Good for him, I guess. How were you not aware of Alex Jones after your Megyn Kelly interview, which Alex claims was a hit piece on him? Did you not watch the segment? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't watch the segment uh, until a latter date. Uh, around approximately the beginning of April, it came to my attention. I had no knowledge of uh, of that that uh, that interviewer. If all the words are up. Statement. Your broadcast. For fuck's sake, I don't think he understood that one either. Have you saved any copies of written threats shared with you online or via email? As I said, I'm not a, a big email person or computer person. Uh, I even like cell phone to. I, they're kicking around, some of them, a few of them. I, know I never probably should have categorized them, but I, I haven't. No. How will the outcome of this trial allow mm -hmm. you to restore Jesse's legacy? Well, the outcome of this trial, um, it, it'll, it'll set it straight that Alex Jones was wrong with what he said and did. And my hopes is with that, I'll be able to clear Jesse's legacy and his honor and moving on in the future. We'll, we won't have to deal with the conspiracy or a hoax theory about Jesse or myself, but mainly Jesse. He's the one that deserves it. Um, is there a specific amount you feel would bring you closure with Alex Jones? Very good question. Um, because it's not really about the closure. The, uh, the monetary amount is uh, about making a strong statement and preventing Alex Jones and people in the future from doing what was done to me and my family and Jesse. I, I don't, it can't be a slap on the wrist. It can't be like somebody getting a speeding ticket and just paying a ticket and then they go out and, and do the same thing over again. It's got to be, there's got to be substantial consequences for the actions to prevent that from failing or ha continuing to happen or happening again in the future. 
the monetary amount has to make a statement for that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Heslin. You may return back to the council table. Mr. Ball, your next witness. The plaintiff's call, Scarlett Lewis. Ms. Lewis, if you would please introduce yourself to the jury. My name's Scarlett Lewis, and I am first and foremost the mom of two boys, Jesse and his surviving brother, and, uh, and I'm the founder of the Jesse Lewis Choose Love Movement. I would like for you to tell us, please, where you were when you first became aware of this disgusting conspiracy that Jesse's murder didn't happen. Uh, I was in shock uh, and just trying to maintain, but I do remember that there was some hushed whispering going around about people talking about something and they didn't want me to know, so of course I <coughs> wanted to know. And uh, they were telling me that uh, there was uh, someone saying that, uh, that the tragedy hadn't happened, which was so crazy to me because I was living it. Is this the first time you became aware of Alex Jones and his associates? Yes. There's just no easy way to say it. This woman has diarrhea of the mouth. She rambles. She meanders, and she even talks about what she had for breakfast. And after dealing with her ex-husband's mumbling and whispering, not to mention the judge's sudden lenience for all this, I've lost my patience for this clown show, and I'll be cutting out all her bullshit so that we can focus on the important details. So first off, this is a nasty death threat sent by voicemail. But it was a voicemail sent to someone else, not Ms. Lewis. Plus, Jones can't be held responsible for something someone else did. He doesn't even know this woman. Cunt. And what are you going to do about it? You should do absolutely nothing. You're a loser. You're going to rot in hell. The way this is saying death, you're going to die. Death is coming to you real soon, motherfucker. You're going to die. After this, they all went to lunch. And when they returned, Jones had finally arrived. This is when all hell broke loose, because I'm pretty sure these personal injury lawyers must have paid someone to sit and watch InfoWars all day, every day. Check this out. I want to bring to the court's attention now that while Mr. Heslin was on the stand, uh, Alex Jones was on his radio show uh, saying, what I believe to be pretty much per se defamatory statements of Mr. Heslin. And in addition to that, what he had to say about Mr. Heslin in this process, and even mentioned Mrs. Lewis's name, I believe goes directly to her claim for intentional infliction of emotional stress. And I am going to admit through her the video of Mr. Jones on his show not 45 minutes or so ago. I want to bring that to the court's attention now in case we need to talk about it so that the jury doesn't have to leave when I bring it up. All right. Are you going to have an objection? I haven't seen the clip. Um, is it the whole show that you'd like to bring in? Or just a piece it of certainly it? isn't the whole show I'd like to bring in. I don't think it has any value except for the statement that I'm talking about, and I can play that now. All right. Why don't you do that? Sure. I thought it was an act when I saw some of the stuff on TV just because he came off his show. Let's just say he's 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 a, he's, a, he's a nice man, and he's not an act. He is um, being manipulated by some very bad people. But I'll just say, because I got to be honest, he's slow, okay? And his ex-wife is not. I don't think he's stupid. I'm just saying he's he's. I've got family members that are really smart in a lot of ways, but they're just real kind of quiet and have this way about them and. And, and they, they, they move at a different pace, like they're fast in some ways and slow in others, and he's... I mean, I think Heslin acts like somebody on the spectrum. And that makes me feel like an even bigger jerk. But when I saw him, like, there's something about this guy. This doesn't look... And now that I've been around him for over a week, I'm like, okay. Now I know. And look, folks, I don't have some calculated point just bringing that up here. It's just that I'm around these people and I'm looking at it and I'm watching what's being said and what's 
going on, it really then makes it clear what happened. I, I've been told that there it goes on, and uh, he says that he's sorry, and we'd ask that the entire part be clear. Spit your gum out, Mr. Jones. It's not gum. Well, what is it? Because you're not allowed food or gum of any kind in the corporate. I, I, I had my tooth pulled. Uh, a week and a half ago, and it's I, have, I had some gauze in there earlier, and it's it's been causing me to have some pain. So you're chewing on your gauze. Would you like me to show you? No, right I here? just want you to answer my question. No, I, I was massaging the hole in my mouth with my tongue. I'm right here. Right here. I don't want to see right. the inside of your mouth. Oh no, there's no gum. Hole. Sit down. <clears throat> Do you want to play the rest of it to see if you'll? I mean, if we're going to go on this path, it could go on all day. I don't want to play it because it, it, defaming someone and continuing this whole saga and then saying I'm sorry is an optional completeness. Well, I, I agree with that. Um, you haven't seen it. You don't know what it says. Um, I'm not going to play it if you are not prepared to play it. So... Um, your request to be denied at that time, I guess, or now. I can deny it now. Uh, we're not going to play. I'm this. not going to play anything extra that I haven't seen, that you haven't seen, that you're not prepared to show me. We don't know what it says. I, I would object to playing of any tape, Your Honor. I think that it just injects error into this record. There is no purpose to it. Um, I object to it, Your Honor, and I object also that. I've you know, I haven't been given adequate notice or been able to review the whole tape to see what other things should be played as well. Well, it's hard to give you more notice when it just was created today. That's that's about as much notice as you can get, I think. So that is certainly overruled as far as an objection. The other objections, I don't know what objection there is no purpose to it is. I guess relevance. Um, it's definitely relevant. So the objection is to relevance that I'm reading into what you said is overruled. The objection as to notice is overruled. We've also had other attorney and judge conversations about statements made during this trial and how there doesn't have to be any more notice than it's naive, it's new, that's the notice. So of course they went ahead and played it for the jury too. Ms. Lewis never acknowledged the jury at all. She looked only at Jones the whole time, lecturing him about things he said 10 years ago. Then you get on and you say, oh, sorry, but I know actresses when I see them. Do you think I'm an actress? No, I don't think you're an actress. No, you can't talk right now. Sorry, I, I, I did. I asked him a question. You, can, you get to testify right now. You're under oath. Nobody else in the room is. Unfortunately, Jones still doesn't get to testify, even when he gets on the witness stand. We'll be getting to that very soon. I talked about <coughs> how an angry thought started that whole tragedy and that an angry thought can be changed. And I asked everybody to choose a loving thought over an angry thought. And uh, that changed people's lives. Really? It's that simple, huh? It changed lives, you say? Why don't you use that same technique when you're thinking about Alex Jones? Although I would guess the money is probably better, I'd take the cash. But if you really want to hear her say something batshit crazy, just listen to this. I liken it to being in a car accident and you run over someone and cause tremendous bodily damage and you look at that person lying on the ground and say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, but I'm not accountable or responsible for any of the damage that I just caused. But I'm sorry. I feel bad for her, but this shit is nuts. That's how I see it. Would you, this moment in time, when you're sitting on that stand, now be at the stage where you would be able to accept an apology? Would it mean anything to you? No, no. Neither of them will accept apologies for the things Jones said several years ago. Just make your check payable to our legal team. Thanks. You're a published author. I am. And um, 
I think you've written three books. I have. A children's book and... Before the tragedy. And then since then you've written two. Nurturing, Healing, Love, and um, Choose Love. It's, it's about the movement and about the program and the history of that and how it can possibly impact people. That's the third book. Yes. Uh, you work at your foundation. I do. And I think you have five or six employees? Yes. You've made uh, many media appearances. Yes. Starting in 2013 and ongoing to the present day. Correct. You've appeared on CNN. Yes? Yes. Various talk shows. Yes. You're also a motivational speaker. I speak for the Choose Up movement. I speak to schools and, and at parent groups. You speak to private organizations as well. Uh, I have on a limited basis. If one navigates to the Choose Love Movement website, one can find a place where one can make an inquiry for a private event. Yes. And it says you'll speak for two hours. I'll speak for as long as you will let me speak. Man, she ain't kidding. I cut out two hours of her rambling on about all kinds of things. From 2013, or from the, the day of the shooting until let's say this litigation began. No one at InfoWars, and certainly not Alex Jones, ever said your name. I don't know that. Have you asked? Have I asked InfoWars? Have you asked anyone whether your name was ever mentioned? I guess I feel like it has been an association. And that's because you feel that by speaking about parents in general that is a reference to you in particular. It concludes me, yeah, I feel like it does. InfoWars has never published your photograph. Thank you. InfoWars has never published your address. Are these questions, Ms. Reno? Have they? I don't know. Are you asking me or telling I'm, me? I'm asking you. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. And uh, InfoWars has never directed anyone to harass you, isn't that true? I don't know. They sent people to, to Sandy Hook. Then they've definitely harassed people there. Well, in fairness, they sent... That's my uh, community. And they don't know that I was not going to be around. Well, the people, the people, the person, Dan Badambi, <coughs> went to an, a meeting of, that is set up to hear FOIA requests for information regarding the Sandy Hook shooting. True? I don't know, but I did see him harass people on the way out, and I know the people that he harassed. Understood. That, yes. was, a, that was an open government meeting. True? I don't know. I don't really know. I don't know what FOIA stands for. Freedom of information. Okay. So she doesn't even know what a FOIA request is. I believe we're done here. Next. I have Somebody from the plaintiff's side who's another Honor. witness for the jury. Honor, plaintiff's trust. Thank you very much. Mr. Reynal, it is your turn to present your case. Do you have a witness for the jury? I have a motion I need to make outside the presence of the jury, Your Honor. All right. This shouldn't take very long. Remember, my instructions are all still in place. I have them back to the jury spot. All rise. You may be seated. You may. Thank At this time, uh, defendants will present their motion for directed verdict. We'll file same um, with the court, but I just wanted to give your honor a brief summary. Um, it is our position that um, plaintiff's IIED claim uh, fails as a matter of law. The evidence as adduced from the witness stand shows that it is predicated upon the statements made by um, Mr. Jones, as well as his employees on the air, and as such, it is duplicative of the defamation claim, and under Texas law, uh, shouldn't uh, go forward. Either as to Ms. Lewis, or as to Mr. Heslin, who also has a standalone uh, defamation claim. As for the defamation claim itself, we believe that the evidence uh, shows that the, uh, the statements were not on the Owen Schroeder broadcast, were not uh, defamatory, and so we think Your Honor should reconsider her decision. 
Um, we urge that reputation damages have not been properly proven. Um, in Anderson versus Durant, the Texas Supreme Court case, uh, the court wrote that rumors within a community are not enough, and instead the evidence must show that people believe the statements and the plaintiff's reputation was actually affected. As to Mr. Heslin, who has the only reputation claim, we had no evidence of anybody who uh, denied him work or denied him credit or <coughs> denied him access to some sort of social organization. So uh, we think those should be stricken. Uh, we also uh, would urge that the uh, mental anguish damages have not been properly uh, proven. All right. Response? Uh, yes. First, with regard to the IED claim, uh, defendants first advance a gap filler argument, meaning that the, uh, uh, the claim sounds in defamation and it doesn't fill a gap in the law and can't be IED. First, we would point out that this is already law of the case. Defendant Hobbs has uh, appealed this on both of the claims, Lewis and Heslin. Texas, uh, Texas Supreme Court rejected that appeal. Texas Court of Appeals says they are not duplicative. Uh, it is not a gap filler issue. Uh, even if there wasn't already law of the case, uh, the uh, Mr. Heston's claim for defamation clearly sounds in statements about himself, while the two plaintiffs' IED claims sounds in statements regarding the circumstance of their child's death. Uh, those are um, there are statements in which Mr. Jones made, for instance, in which he did not claim that children did die. Instead, he claimed that the children were murdered as part of a two-year pre-planned CIA plot that does not actually affect their reputation whatsoever. So it's not even accused of But it is, nonetheless, in the translation of the most uh, That is also law. Uh, with regard to reputational damages, uh, the simple evidence alone that Mr. Huston testified that an individual, while yelling out Alex Jones and Info, were spotted at a firebomb near his home is clearly legally sufficient on its own to achieve reputational damage. But there's been plenty of testimony <coughs> about people in the community who have negative thoughts about, about these parents and them in particular, um, and Mr. Hessen in particular. And so for that reason, the reputational fault. As far as the mental anguish damage, I don't know a better way you can have legally sufficient evidence than by having two separate psychologists, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, one who has a formal diagnosis and who related it to these events, as well as the personal testimony of the plaintiffs about the torment in their lives. Uh, as such, we believe that measure could direct the verdict is frivolous. A reply, Mr. Reynolds. All right. The motion for a directed verdict is denied. <coughs> Any other motions we need to take up outside the presence of the jury? I the copy. I of couldn't hear. Say it again. You did what? Uh, I don't have any other motions, Your Honor, but I have a copy of the the full clip uh, to play for the jury uh, for, of Mr. Jones's broadcast today. Um, I have uh, two versions. One of it. One of the versions has some remarks about the attorneys. Uh, as well as the court. I didn't know if your owner wanted me to play that clip or one that has been edited to take that out. Uh, our response is I think this is being offered for auction completeness. I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Exactly. It okay, is. So let me, let me, okay, then if it is for optional completeness, then the rule of optional completeness requires me to identify a specific statement made within the recorded part that was played with the jury while also identifying a specific, and also identifying how that statement existing on its own could be fundamentally misleading to the jury. Then they must identify a specific statement in the portion that they would like to play that is necessary for the jury to have them to properly understand what just happened. Otherwise, they will be misled. I have What I have heard is basically that after calling Mr. Heslin mentally challenged and autistic and claiming that his ex-wife and all of us lawyers are exploiting him, that then they want to play an apology or some other, other things that Mr. Jones says that they think will be good for them. That is not a way in which you actually clear up any fundamental misleading bit in that video. So for us, we'll complete this out. Your Honor, the argument that's been made is that Mr. Jones continues on his show to deny that the plaintiffs are real, that to say that they're actors, that there's some kind of a CIA plot. I mean, this seems to be a big part of the plaintiff's presentation, and it's just not true. And this clip shows, he says, these are real people. I've been sitting next to them. I'm sorry for what I did. You know, and in that sense, their, um, their portrayal of it is misleading. So I didn't actually hear any of that from Mr. Ball, so that's not their portrayal. 
Uh, I heard some testimony from Ms. Lewis about how she feels about it. Uh, again, I don't think that constitutes a portrayal. Um, I think, do you have, let me put it this way. I believe that Mr. Bankston is correct in how he describes the rule of optional completeness. Do you have an argument to make for why whatever portion of this video you think needs to be played is required for the jury to not be confused by the portion they heard um, earlier today? It's the argument I already made here. And Your Honor, I'm just quite that the, the idea that he's saying that they're not like he wants to play it so he can show that Mr. Jones believes that they're real. Literally said that in the video that we just played. Right, I, I did hear that as well. Um, also, the claim that he's been sitting next to them all week, I heard that also. Um, I have a hard time imagining, and I have not watched it, um, that any clip that includes a conversation about what's happening in court this week can be in any way helpful to the jury in their job. Um, I've certainly, can you please sit down, Mr. Jones? It is not your turn to talk. I will happily allow Mr. Raynal a minute to hear all of your suggestions uh, if you and he think that is necessary, but you have to wait. Um, I haven't watched any of it, so I don't know what it says. If you want to send it to me and have me watch it um, on a break, I will do that. But um, there are a number of people who have been writing to me and telling me what Mr. Jones is saying every day. I don't know if they're accurate or not in their descriptions. I'm not otherwise going to find out. So I will only see this if you send it to me and ask me to look at it. Would you like to confer with your client? I think he wants you to say something else. They got me from seconds off. I don't know if she is real, but I cut that off. So she thinks I'm thinks it's real. She's totally confused because they gave her a confusing clip. It's the definition of the law. We'd simply re-urge that uh, it's confusing for the jury because the clip leaves out the part where Mr. Jones says that he certainly believes that Ms. Lewis is real. All right, so if you want to send me that part, that may in fact meet the requirements of uh, the rule of optional completeness and uh, send it to my uh, staff attorney and she'll review it and then I'll review it on a break and I'll let you know. Thank you. Anything else before we bring the jury back? No, you don't. Anything from your side? All right. We're ready to have the jury back. All right, you may all be seated. Mr. Reynal, do you have a witness for the jury? I do. The defense would call Alex E. Jones. All right, Mr. Jones, come stand in front of me, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm, under penalty of perjury, that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Come have a seat. Um, in the witness chair, there is water and glasses. You have pretty good volume. I don't think you'll need to lean into the microphone. I see that you have a document with you. I don't know if you were here when I explained to a prior witness who brought documents with them that you can't look at any document for any reason while you're testifying until and unless one of the lawyers or myself instructs you to do so. So I'm going to ask you to actually just give it back to Mr. Raynal until he may think you need it, okay? Okay. Did you understand all that? I did, yes. Okay. While you testify, it is not a conversation. It is a question and answer. So the instructions are to let the lawyers completely finish asking their questions before you begin your answer, to listen to the question and answer what is asked, you can't always say that you don't know or you don't understand if those things are true. To answer out loud in words and not head shakes and the like. Um, I think that that's all my instructions. I say it so many times, sometimes I forget one thing, but I think those are all. Do you understand them? I do. All right. You may begin, Mr. Reynolds. Alex, would you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Hi, I'm Alex Jones. How are you feeling today, Alex? I actually feel good because I get a chance to, for the first time, say what's really going on instead of the corporate media and high-powered law firms manipulating what I actually did. I want to um, start by kind of 
letting the jury know a little bit about your youth and where you grew up so they can get to know you better. Is that okay? Okay. And, and you know, before we do that, I just do want to say this on record because I've said it many times. I apologize to both. Uh, sustained. So, Mr. Jones, one of the instructions I just gave you is that this is not a conversation. Question and answer. So she got the monologue, but not me. I got it. And so you have to only answer questions that are asked of you. Mr. Reynal will ask you, I'm certain, all the questions you want, but okay. you have to wait for the question. Mr. Jones, have you been wanting to uh, apologize to the plaintiffs in this case for a long time? Yes. And what would you like to say to them? That I never intentionally tried to hurt you. I never even said your name until this case came to court. Uh, I didn't even really know who you were until a couple years ago when all this started up. The internet had a lot of questions. I had questions. And over that six, seven year period before I got sued, or six year period, it, it's clear you can see the whole progression of us, the few times we covered it, trying to actually find out what happened. And that's really been my big frustration is that the people have said that I'm personally trying to hurt them or coming after them when I question every big event. And a lot of times it turns out that we've not been uh, told the truth. And a perfect example is today where they play a 30 or a one minute clip and I had just done that this morning and I knew that I said I believe that Scarlett Lewis is real and she's a really you know, nice person and she's really a sweet person and then I went through and talked about her ex-husband too and then, the, then I said I believe they're being fed and manipulated and this is a perfect sustained. this is a perfect sustained. Mm -hmm. when you hear sustained you have to stop okay. talking okay. Okay. Do you feel that the video clip was a fair representation of what uh, what you meant to convey? No, it had the front and back, no. Okay, and why wasn't it fair? Because it had the front and back cut off of it to totally misrepresent the apology at the end and at the first where I said, I believe she's a real person and lost her child. So someone edited that and then showed it to her and then they brought it in here and played it to show it to you, and I think you should ask to see the full segment. All right. So now that we've got that out of the way, um, I want to ask you some questions about where you grew up and how you came to have your business. Can you let us know where where are you from in Texas originally? I first was born in Dallas, then I grew up in a suburb of Dallas called Rockwell. And how old were you when you moved to Austin? Sixteen. And can you tell the members of the jury why your family relocated to Austin? My dad sold his dental practice, and there was too much crime in Dallas, and Austin was a safer city. Were you still in high school when you moved? Yes. Here? And did you graduate from high school? Yes. Are you married? Yes. How many children do you have? I have four. And is your wife present in the courtroom today? She is. She's right there. Okay. And what's her name? Erica. I want to ask you some questions about how you got started up in, in media with your radio show, okay? How old were you when you first uh, felt that you wanted to be on the air, that you wanted to, to work in media? When I was about 17, I really liked listening to talk radio, and I'd grown up with my dad on road trips listening to like Larry King when he was still on radio. and. I really liked Larry King on radio and then also on CNN. And I also liked Howard Stern, th thought he was funny. And I really wanted to be a talk show host. And how did you take that desire to be a talk show host and, and those early influences, how did you translate that into action? How did you first get on the air? I had been out of high school about a year and a half, two years, and I went down and took classes at the Access TV station here in Austin, one of the first places to ever have Access TV, they had one of the best systems. So they had uh, a lot of equipment and a lot of studio space. A lot of it was old, antiquated, but still very useful. So I became self-taught uh, with that equipment. And in about 94, 95, and then 95 started doing uh, my own little call-in shows. And then those became pretty popular uh, quickly. And so, the phone rang, and a, and a DJ by the name of Shark Man, who had a national show that was managing the local station, 98.9, Nine, 
said, I think you should come in and do like a three-hour radio show this Saturday and see what people think. And they had Howard Stern on their station. They had G. Ward and Lady, a bunch of other big hosts. They had some other big local hosts who couldn't like the phone lines up. And the first time I went in, they got about 100 calls the first night. How old were you? I was, uh, I think I was 21, 22 by then. And what was the format of your early shows on Austin Public Access TV? It wasn't as conspiratorial or political. There was some of that because there was other people doing those shows, and I already knew about that information. Uh, but it was just all over the map. It was just really call-in shows and different topics. Did variety shows like Carved Pumpkins on TV on Halloween and, you know, have a guy come in with his pet monkey and it, you know, dances around. Just fun stuff. Because I also liked uh, Johnny Carson growing up. Did people like your show? They did. And did you, uh, did your... Did your show, I mean, it sounds sort of like a, almost like a Wayne's World kind of thing. Uh, I think Wayne's World's a good way to describe it. And did it, uh, did it win any accolades? It did. It, it won Best of Austin a few times in the newspaper and pretty much started getting written about and even national coverage in about two years. Really? And so tell us in those, you've told us already about Larry King and about Howard Stern. Who would you say influenced you artistically in the format and, and how you, you did your show uh, then and became the, the man you are today? I mean, really, I, I, I listen to Larry King a lot because my dad listened to him on the radio um, a lot when I was so from the time I was like six, seven, I remember listening to Larry King. And then I'd watch him a lot of nights at home in junior high and high school. So I would, I would say more than anybody, Larry King. And did there come a time when, because of your success and having uh, won this uh, Listener's Choice Award or Viewer's Choice Award, that uh, you were able to be syndicated? Well, I want a couple of those. I don't think the syndication folks were even paying attention to that. I, I built a studio in a bedroom in my house because they wouldn't put the equipment in at the local station where I had you know, top ratings um, to syndicate it. And so I went home, got the equipment, had an engineer come set it up and then called a syndication outfit and um, got a sponsor and then I paid to put it on the satellite. And then I got about probably 60, 70 affiliates in about a month and then it went up to several hundred affiliates after that. Can you describe for us what the setup was like? Was it in a spare bedroom? It was. And what kind of furniture was in there? It was a simple wooden desk and a microphone and a little mixer and then a, a chair if I had a guest. And what is syndication for, for those of us that don't know? Instead of being on one station, it goes up at that time to a satellite, now a lot of it's over the internet, and then that's beamed back down, and then other stations can pick it up. And so you said you were syndicated on how many uh, radio stations? It fluctuated between 30 or 40 at first, and as much as over 200. I would say things that were politically not popular to talk radio, more left-wing things like being anti-war or, or things like that, and I would lose a bunch of stations, and I would gain more stations, but talk radio was mainly conservative. And so when 9-11 came around and I had questions, we lost 70% uh, of our affiliates in one month because I didn't want to uh, you know, attack all these foreign countries, but I still was steadfast and had that message, so then I got real popular with the left-wing but I wasn't trying to be left-wing, I was trying to follow the right thing, even though it made me lose most of my radio stations, which is the issue of how I do what I think's right, sometimes I'm wrong, I've been more right than wrong, but I do, don't do it for the monetary thing. I do it to tell the truth, and, or to try to tell the truth, and then the monetary comes with that, because people can tell this guy's not reading off the script, uh, and with that comes its own issues. Uh, but I'm not lying like the corporate media on purpose, that's the big difference. And so let's focus in on this 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 early period. What year did you get syndicated? I syndicated myself in 1998. And at that time, did you already have the the show name, the Infowar? Yes. What no, no, it, it it wasn't ever called Infowars. It was just the Alex Jones Show. Because you have to call the show your name, because that's how they did it with the ratings that were written in on little diaries. So to be on radio, you had to say the name of the show coming in and out. It was like TV for Nielsen ratings, so it was the Alex Jones Show. Tell us about InfoWars. How did uh, the name InfoWars come to be, and how did that business start? 
Vic Freeland, who was an Air Force veteran, who worked in Air Force Intelligence in Vietnam. He was the Deputy Fire Chief in Austin, and he was a listener, and he'd done some talk radio interviews. He'd been on some syndicated shows, because magazine articles he'd written. And he came to some of the events, and he said, listen, you know, you're really involved in an information war, that's the, and and because all information is propaganda, whether it's true or not, it's called information war, and so you ought to try to get that URL. And he had a big old laptop. He said, "Look, it's available. Do you want Infowars.com?" And so Vic Freeland got the site. He then, even in his spare time, because he was still working with the fire department, then he uh, built the basic site and stuff. Then helped find me a. a volunteer or whatever at first we didn't really have any money to then start updating the site a little bit every day and that was in 1997 so 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 infowars came from an air force intelligence term so at the you had the alex jones show that was being uh broadcast and you also had infowars at the same time yes i had a radio show at the time i was doing a local radio show and then i was doing the, the, the syndicated one out of my house and then I had a website that I could post articles on or links to to say, look, this is on the site, go check it out on air. So it's kind of a way to make radio almost like TV because the internet was starting to become more effective and, and, and more, where it actually worked, where it's not effective, where you could actually post stuff and do things. And so we could put things on there and show people what we were talking about. Did you also start making, uh, in order to support InfoWars, did you also start making uh, documentaries? I did start making documentaries in 1997. I made my first documentary, America Destroyed by Design, about the Great Reset that was coming and the different UN documents that were in it. And then I made more than 25 more films after that. Why, um, why make the films? Most talk show hosts would sell a coffee cup or a newsletter to fund themselves, and I wanted to build a larger news organizations. I wanted to do more and I wanted to make documentaries so I went out and made documentaries and used the money from that to make more documentaries because that way you could show people what it was you were talking about in a, in a format before there was really the internet. Because even though the internet was around, it was mainly text and pictures in 96, 90, you know, 7, 8, 9, documentaries on VHS and then DVD was uh, you know the way people interface with that. And at the time, what was your main topic of interest that you wanted to explore through your documentaries as well as through your radio show and your website? The plan to cut off U.S. energy reserves that we're now experiencing, the plan to cut off uh, all coal power generation, then gas, and uh, the uh, forced move on to renewables, but that it was in the documents they didn't plan to even have those. It was a post-industrial uh, program called Agenda 21 that George Herbert Walker Bush signed on to in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. And I read the plan, and it said we're building a post-industrial world. And we're going to have a controlled demolition of civilization to force depopulation. And, and now that's mainline news. Bill Maher called for depopulation last Friday night. In addition to your documentaries, uh, are you also an author? I am, yes. How many books have you written? I've written two and contributed to more than 20. We'll talk about your, your latest book later. Um, let's move forward a little bit. At, in 2001, um, what, if anything, happened with you and, uh, and your program at YouTube? Before YouTube came around in, I think, 2004, and then it was out of some guy's garage in San Francisco that bought by Google around that time. We were actually putting out videos ourselves that we were streaming ourselves, but it became too expensive, so we had to stop. We were doing that by, by, by 2000, 2001. And I mean, these are all the technical things, but then Google Video came around, and we had, we had videos on there with, with millions of people that watched them. And we were just putting them out for free, and it was uh, it was very popular with the left because it was us tracking and 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 protesting the KKK 
It was us exposing police brutality uh, and things like that. And I wasn't trying to be left wing. I just thought those were really important topics. And so I got really popular with the left wing then. And they went and had me speak in San Francisco and New York. And I got big awards, you know, by the big uh, liberal Democrat channels. Let me ask you about, about that part, because that's an, an aspect of, of your work and, and who you are that you cultivate, which is different from in the studio. Um, from the very beginning, did you believe it was important to go to demonstrations, to talk to the people on the street, to be part of protests? Absolutely. And how did that play into what you were trying to do at InfoWars? Well, InfoWars is a radio show on TV. I and mean, that's really what Oprah Winfrey is too. It's just, a, but, but I mean, that's, it all goes back to radio when I started 100 years ago, or a little bit more now. And so that's a separate thing. A talk show with opinions and people debating is like The View. They're not fact checking, they're just giving their opinions. When I'm on the radio show, most of the time I'm just a pundit giving my opinion. Everybody on talk radio knows that. We play devil's advocates, we look at both sides. I don't do that very often now because people can edit tapes and hurt you bad. And I would say, well, let's look at this. They're saying this, and they believe that. And now let's look at this. Uh, and as later as I realized my show had a lot more power than I thought, I realized, well, even if I'm not the one editing these tapes, I've got to be more careful because there's bad guys out there that uh, that will do it. But the films I'm proud of, we didn't ever put any films out about Sandy Hook, never had any products about Sandy Hook. The films we would try to really vet and do more journalistic research into and fact check and interview uh, renowned people. I mean, I interviewed like former U.S. Attorney Generals and members of Congress and former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I mean, that's who we would go for these films. Top economists, you know, just really big names for these films. And they were very, very popular. So that's where I've been journalistic and done a good job. I guess with the age of the internet and people grabbing clips out of talk radio or talk TV and mixing it together, I can see how um, it can you know, cause problems. That's why I've admitted that I've made a lot of mistakes, but none of it was done from some master plan uh, deal. It was done from a bedroom in my house. Sustained. So one of the things I notice uh, about you is that you have a very uh, distinctive voice. Um, very deep, sort of gravelly voice. Uh, did your voice always sound that way? No. What What happened to your voice? Why does it sound the way it does? Well, I remember the two demonstrations where I finally wrecked it. Um, and one was about, I guess about 12, 13 years ago. <coughs> it was actually film of it. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you have some way to tie this to the damages portion of this? <laughs> uh -huh. No, no, no. I'll address you if I'm talking to you. Uh, this is so that the jury can understand who my client is and, and properly assess his credibility, his demeanor. Sustained. Let me um, ask you directly about InfoWars as we're coming into the period where Sandy Hook occurs, okay? Yes. About how many employees did you have circa 2012? I'd say about 45, 50. And where were you broadcasting from? What year? 2012. Oh, I was broadcasting from offices, studio. In terms of size, how does that compare to, for example, the New York Times in terms of how many employees? Objection, speculation. I don't believe this witness has any personal knowledge about the New York Times. So you can only answer the question if you have actual knowledge about how many employees the New York Times has. Otherwise, you have to say I don't know. So as a, as a member of the media, are you generally familiar with the different media organizations that are in the, uh, in the industry? Yes. And based on that knowledge of the industry, can you tell us size-wise how your organization compares to the New York Times or to CNN? It's 
between one one hundredth and one twentieth the size of those different organizations if you counted for employees and bureaucracy and the number of offices and things they do. So I want to ask you some questions about the different formats of the different shows that InfoWars broadcasts. Can you tell us what the sort of different segments are that would appear on a given day at InfoWars circa 2012? There was my four-hour radio show that in 2012 was just a webcam on me for people that wanted to watch it online. And then it was just it was me at a desk with a camera in 2012. And then, um, I mean, that was it, basically. At some point, did you all begin to have additional segments besides just you doing your radio show and answering callers? Well, yes, I mean, that's... Now I understand what your first question was. What was the different types of media we were doing? Yeah. There was the syndicated radio show that was also had a visual component, you know, digital video online, and then there was documentary making, and that's what I had 10 or so people working on with me, and then I started to develop reporters and people to go out and actually cover like live events and protests and things that were going on. Uh, and then we also did everything in-house, so we had our own shipping department uh, to be able to ship out you know, books and films, not just my books and films, but a lot of other authors' books and films. So we would interview a lot of those authors. And so that's what we were doing uh, back then. Now, the, your, uh, your radio show, was it purely uh, a call-in show? Or did you also go sort of on, on rants about different issues that you were seeing? Yes, we would we would have a lot of calls. Sometimes the whole show would be calls. Sometimes it would be all guests. Sometimes I would uh, just decide I had so much news that I was going to just cover up to 100 stories on there and just look at them. The audience knows whether it's the BBC or whether it's an InfoWars story or, or whatever it is, they can choose, they can go look it up for themselves. We're just covering what's in this. And so we just bam, bam, bam. Uh, it's, it's the same way today. Like Pelosi's in Taiwan, what do you think of it? You th think there's going to be a war, the Chinese are threatening war. Oh, look, uh, Biden fell down again. Oh, look, uh, you know, that they found another trailer full of 50 dead people in Texas. This is horrible. we, we got to do something about this. And it's just coming up next. It's real simple. i got a stack of news. Uh, we're going to play a video clip of Bill Maher, um, you know, saying we need to depopulate the, the human population. And we got, well, let's take calls. What do you think about Bill Maher saying we should get rid of the majority of people? Well, who's going to do that? You know, who's going to do the killing? I think this is wrong. I think it's dangerous. I think it sounds like Hitler. I mean, that's what we do. And how did, um, at the time, 2012, how did you all source the, or how did you source the stories that you wanted to cover during that segment of your talk radio or 95 percent of what we were covering was mainstream news going look they're saying this do you believe it or what do you make of this uh the, i mean it's that kind of thing is that we would simply do what talk radio does that's what talk radio does that's what larry king did is stack of news articles talk about what's going on what people are saying ask callers what do you think of that do you buy that what do you think is going to happen next? Uh, are there really WMDs in Iraq? Are they lying about it? And then the talk show hosts make their predictions about what they think, and then the talk radio listeners basically keep note and see who's the most accurate, and it becomes a big game to see who has made the best predictions and things like that. And so that kind of lends itself to, to the very nature of a soapbox is people speculating. That's, that's the nature of people going to a park and, and standing up at Speaker's Corner in London for 600 years and giving their opinion. That's what free speech is. Now, please tell the members of the jury, has your uh, method where you, you get your stories, has that changed over the years from 2012 until today? No, it's not really changed. I mean, we have clips from the news where it's like, here's a clip of this person saying this. And we always try to actually play it in context. That's most of our clips are about two minutes long. So they're not little deceptive clips. We want to show what somebody actually said. And we'll just play a clip, give our opinion, and ask callers what they think about it. Or, again, we'll say, should Pelosi go to Taiwan? The Chinese are threatening war. 
And I said yesterday, I said, I don't really like Pelosi. And I don't want war with China, but I think it's good she's going because we should stand up for ourselves and not be pushed around. And then we take calls and say, what do you think? Well, I think you're wrong. We shouldn't go over there. I think you're right. I mean, it's really that simple. Do you also, uh, did you then and do you now also host debates? We do. How do you decide um, to host a debate and who are going to be the debaters? Any issue that is being contested that people think is interesting. We had a Sandy Hook debate where we had a newspaper reporter on who said he thought that it really happened. And we had like a professor, or however exactly who on, who, who, who thought that there was questions. And that's the type of thing that we did. And I can understand then that people, again, take clips out of that and move that around and that it, it can cause problems. And that's why now, I mean, I can say I'm more, I'm more timid, even though the, the head of the state police questions Uvalde in Texas, and even though they stood down for 77 minutes, I think it happened. But I've just gone, whoa, I'm going to try to leave this alone as much as possible just because they'll take what I've said out of context. But my listeners are now mad at me because I'm not covering it when, I mean, something went on 77 minutes and the kids are begging for help and the police just stand there and the state, the state police in Texas say that the head of the state police says we don't know the truth. And it's because of things like that that people just get completely blown away and confused by what's going on. But now... I realize that those are such touchy subjects that I don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And is that a result of this case? And, and, you know, it's a result of a lot of stuff. Like, in the past, I would have gotten in a car and driven down there. And I think that's what journalists should do. But I, we didn't go down there because I don't want to be associated with the corporate media and the lawyers and the people that swarm around these mass shootings I don't want to be like them. So they've accused me of being Mr. Mass Shooting and all this stuff with Sandy Hook when I've covered less than one-tenth of one percent over the years. And so I don't want to be like them. So we didn't send reporters to Uvalde, and the American people can figure out what's going on. But, but I'm not going to get involved in it. So we've talked about the call-in portion. We've talked about hosting debates. Do you also um, interview, and I think we talked about doing the news, based on what we're reading, do you also uh, interview guests? I do. And do you, do you always select the guests that you're going to interview, or sometimes does one of your producers suggest to you, hey, you should interview this person? In radio, the producer isn't the person paying for it. In you know, Hollywood or TV, the person paying for the entertainment show is called the producer. In radio, it just means the booker. And then they call and get the guests on the line or on Skype, and they check into the person. We get all these guest offers and things. In the past, I would do cursory stuff and sometimes mail it in with guests. That's just what talk radio does. I mean, I was a producer for other shows 25 years ago, not just my own show, and they were pressuring us. I was helping uh, produce on a sports show to get up to five guests an hour. So you're just calling people that are already you know in the news that are sportscasters or pundits, just like ESPN now, he's all these different writers and talk show hosts on the show. So it, it, it's the same for political stuff. You're just you're just getting guests that are in the news that are interesting and then getting their opinion about things. And so now most of the time though, I say I want this person, I want that person, um, and I'm more in control of the guest that I have. But but in the past. Um, we let more things driven by the internet and by 4chan and 8chan that in every case I've had problems has been a curse. I'm not attacking everybody that's on there, but that's, I tell my producers, do not touch it when it's on there because it, it's just, it's the kiss of death and it causes nothing but problems. Why, um, why is it, do you think it's important to interview people who um, are causing a stir on the internet or on social media. Why do you feel like that's a good thing to do in terms of your listeners? Well, I mean, most of the time we're not just interviewing people that have caused a stir. When I say, like, there's a big controversy or there's a big story, if there's riots in Hong Kong and we can find a reporter who will come on the show, we get them on. It's whatever the big topic is. That's just how news is. 
uh, and, and, and more and more, I don't really follow the news model of covering the news. In the past, I did. We still do it a lot. But now I mainly just talk about philosophy and the big picture and then have some guests on. And the show's gotten more Christian, you know, because I'm a Christian, but as things progress, all things happening in the world, I'm moving more towards uh, doing a self-help, uh, life experience type show than the political show. Like I've been trying to segue out of this just because I think we have to change individuals, kind of like Scarlett was saying earlier, more than we're going to change the world. We can't change ourselves, then we're never going to be able to change the world. And I've made a lot of mistakes, and I've learned a lot in that process. And I've also learned how the corporate media is able to completely manipulate a story once you're caught in it, and then manipulate other people. And if anything, I want to teach people about how that process worked because they say I'm the mastermind that figured out how to manipulate people and I didn't have any understanding of it coming in. And now I've seen it from the inside, the way this stuff goes on. And I, again, I think only getting the individual awake and aware and, and not under its control is the way to beat it. And you can't just cover a bunch of news and get somebody to understand that. You you can't be told about the matrix. you got to see it. Let's slow down a little bit. And um, I want to ask you about sort of how your, with these responsibilities, how your typical day sort of shapes up, okay? How many hours a day are you on the air? I'm on the air about four hours a day. And since when have you been on the air about four hours a day? I've been on the air four hours a day since about 1997, 98. And in order to prepare for those four hours that you're going to be on the air every day, well, let me ask you this, how many days a week? I'm on the air uh, six days a week. So in order to prepare for four hours a day, six days a week, how many hours per day do you spend on prep for your show? I spend about two hours at night and about two hours in the morning, and then I do some research in the afternoon. In addition to prepping for your show for about four hours and being on the air for about four hours, do you have other responsibilities? I do. And. What are your other business responsibilities? Well, we don't have a lot of sponsorship because with sponsorship comes the control of the sponsor's political views. And so we, we sell books and films and other things uh, to fund ourselves. And then you've got to source that, you've got to have that, you got to get good deals on that because a lot of times, like in the case of Storable Food, we're only making 20, 30% on it. Uh, so it's, 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 it's you're, you're competing against Amazon. And so, You've got to really spend some time on that. And about how many? So, how about how many hours per day do you spend on general business administration as well? Two or three hours. So, your average day, would you say, is somewhere between eleven hours, twelve hours a day? Yes. Six days a week. Yes. Do you depend on other people to help you produce your show and decide what you're going to talk about? I do. I depend on my crew, and I depend on. Um, I mean, really what they do is they just give me hundreds of clips that are in mainstream news, alternative news, things that are happening, with video clips, and I'll sit there on my computer and just review them, and then I tell them, just print me the top stories off of 10 or 15 news sources, and I say, go through everything, randomly change it up, uh, so everything from Japanese news to news in Mexico to you know the BBC to... Uh, the LA Times, uh, to just everything, and then also alternative media. Uh, but more and more, we just show clips of what's actually happening out in the world. It's not disputed. There's just stacks of news. You can be on air 24 hours a day. All you're doing is like a curator, just showing people, hey, we looked at this, we think it's interesting. We looked at that. Uh, the, the idea that there's like certain stories that are like these big bonanza stories that we focus on is, is, is just not the case. There is a glut of news and information. 
so we've talked about your responsibilities and your duties and your work day at InfoWars. Do you also appear on uh, other people's shows? Yes, I've, I've been on thousands of different programs in the last 27, 28 years. Any that we would have heard of? I've been on Howard Stern and on his network many times. I have been on Joe Rogan's show many times, even predating his current podcast, known in 25 years. I've been on The View. I've been on Piers Morgan. I've been on 20 or 30 BBC shows. I've been on Japanese television. I've been on I've been on Saudi Arabian TV. I've been on Israeli TV. I've been I mean I basically I've been on Brazilian television, Brazilian radio, Mexican TV and radio. I mean I've been on basically a lot. Let's focus in in the year 2012. How many hours per day was InfoWars broadcasting? Not just your show, but everything. Well, there's broadcasting, and then there's just videos that we're uploading. I mean, I'd say... How many hours of content? Six hours, seven hours. Okay, and um, in 2013, about how many hours per day? Uh, the same amount. And 2014? I'd say a little more, maybe seven. And 15? The same. 16? The same. 17? <coughs> sorry, just one second. Oh, I'm sorry. Probably uh, seven, eight hours as well. And 18? Then it increases to 10 hours a day, or in 17 it did. Okay. In 17 it increases to 10 hours a day, and then in, um, in that state of about that. And it's stayed con constant now at about 10 hours per day since then? It, 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 there's 10 hours that's always there, this talk radio on TV. And then we also put out some other reports and videos. Okay, so the answers you just gave us of seven hours per day basically up until 2016 and then starting in 2017 10 hours per day that is content that's on the radio that's being streamed and being picked up by some radio stations so as we sit here today since 2017 infowars has been producing about 3120 hours of <laughs> content per year i haven't done the math is, is that what that calculates out to I will represent to you that it is. It's, uh, I mean, six days a week. We do a little bit less on s uh, Sunday. Sometimes do stuff on Saturday. I mean, that, that sounds about right. There's no exact number. I never, we never organize it all, so I don't know. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. When did you start bringing on other hosts that have their own programs? I think we started the Nightly News in like 2000. 2015, I, can't, I don't have the exact dates. So so we started the nightly news that David Knight and, and Leanne Mackey and others would host sometime before the 2016 election. How did you pick who was going to be the first uh, the first host of the nightly news? Well, I hosted it sometimes, and so did David Knight, mainly. <coughs> I'm sorry, I had a really bad deal here. Um, Do you need some more water? No, it, it's... It, I've, it's a torn larynx. It's got a lot worse. It's real bad this week, so that's what's going on. It's the <laughs> voice like that. Um, it, it'll get better in a minute. What were we saying? I was asking if... Uh, <coughs> Sorry, go ahead. If uh, David Knight won a contest in order to be on the show. Yes, he did. Tell us about how that worked. We had a contest of news videos and reports either the best. And I, think, I don't think he won. I, I think he entered the contest... <laughs> but then we we uh, hired him. He came out with his family from North Carolina. And he was an engineer and also had done a lot of uh, writing for publications and things. And so he was just a natural for the show. Mr. Jones. Oh, thank you very much. I'm sorry. I just, I just I meant to have surgery on this. It's, it's 
It's been like this for 10 years, and it's really bad now. That's the exception to the food in the corporate. <laughs> there you go. You have a nice meal. Sorry, go ahead. Um, Alex, uh, you obviously have a very busy work schedule to yourself. For yourself, do you tell the other hosts what to say or what to cover? <laughs> We're starting to. <laughs> well, I mean, no, not in the past. Not really. Very rarely. Other than I try to pick people that already have done shows that I've seen their work that I think are trying to tell the truth and are smart and who are funny. I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, but they're definitely, we're trying to put in more, more oversight and be more careful, obviously, about what we do. We've, we've definitely learned a lesson from this process of not just things we did wrong, but how people misrepresent what we've done. Is it fair to say that yourself and most of your hosts are self-taught uh, through the radio business? Owen has a degree in, in media. But he'll tell you he didn't learn anything with that. It was all working at those radio stations from the bottom, you know, up. He got on air at probably the top. And it was the same way. Owen had a similar deal that I did. I mean, I volunteered when I was at Talk Radio. Um, I wasn't paid the first six months, and then I got into sales and things. But I was I was doing producing for sports shows. We uh, I even got hired by the Howard Stern Show uh, to do a, a interview with uh, Dennis Hopper. And, and some other folks at, at, at a big film festival at the Governor's Mansion. Uh, so I did that, and I've worked for Howard Stern on that job. Uh, so I was doing everything. And then that was unpaid uh, to, 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 to do that. Would you say that the organization is more like a, a radio show or more like a, like a newspaper like the, uh, the Austin Statesman? No, we don't pretend to be... We're more like the op-ed page in a newspaper, giving our opinion than, say, the investigative journal section of something. So yes, we're, we're like the op-ed, or we're like the funny papers in, 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 as well. I mean, we've got really serious stuff we do, where we say, here's the documents, here's where they said it, this is what's going on, and then we also have the op-ed opinion stuff we do, which is what talk radio is, and then we also um, have satire and uh, you know things like that, where it's completely obvious that I'm dressed up in like like Cobra Commander, that I'm not actually Cobra Commander. People know that's a joke. Let's talk a little bit about where you get your funding. Um, when is the last time you had a a corporate sponsor for InfoWars? You mean a big one? Yeah. I had some corporate sponsors when I was against George George Herbert, George W. Bush and the war. We lost a lot because we were anti-war, but we still had some big ones. I mean, we had like car companies, uh, clothing lines, everything. We were making a lot of money to expand the operation. Going back to about 2005, up to when Obama got in. And then being anti-war was not allowed anymore, for whatever reason. I wasn't anti-Obama, I was anti-war. So I continued with being anti-war and we lost all our sponsors. We lost, uh, that was almost, the, was about 80% of the money we were making with sponsors. You know, sort of, we lost about $10 million that was gross money to fund the operation right away when uh, we didn't, uh, didn't tow the line with all the wars. And so when you lost all that corporate sponsorship because of your, your position against the war, did uh, you transition to a different business model? Yes, we'd already been selling some books and films, but we accelerated it. And I said, well, I'm not going to let them shut me down. I said this on air. I said, you want to shut us down? We're $10 million a year. I'm going to, I remember saying, I'm going to go to $70 million a year, and I'm going to put it into everything. We're going to advertise. We're going to explode. And so that was my promise, and I fulfilled it. And why is it important for you to be self-funded? That's what the system fears. It's actually come out in some of the presidential library documents out of uh, Little Rock that they the system fears any independent organic media, whether it's liberal or conservative, that isn't controlled by the big corporations. They want a fake left and a fake right that's synthetic. And, and by fake, they're, they're real groups. They just kind of toe a line, stay within certain guardrails, and then society doesn't ever change for the better. 
Instead, we need independent grassroots media that is self-funded, whether it be through donations or whether it be through product sales, so that we can have real diversity of ideas in this world we live in. What do you, you use the term synthetic as well as steak. What do you mean when you say synthetic? You know, these are a lot of military terms that I learned just by researching psychological warfare because I knew that they were using it against us. So I went and last 20 years got some of the declassified ones. But a synthetic event is real stuff happening, but they put in place people to help it happen and kind of provocateur to get it started. It's like you have two pit bulls killing each other. That's a real event, but people that throw them in that pin together for that fight, they made it happen. They brought the dogs there. They raised the dogs. They trained them how to fight. They threw them in the pit. So there's two dogs really killing each other, but it's synthetic because people made it happen. So when I talk about staged, most of the time I mean they knew it was going to happen and they stood down and let it happen. And that was my view the first few years of Sandy Hook. Anybody can pull up the Washington Post, you name it, about FBI going out there, him threatening to ship a school, nothing being done. Same story, CIA, so he was hacking stuff. Was that, So that's where everybody thought it was really suspicious up front was because those telltale signs that we've seen before of those type of synthetic connections, which don't always mean it was staged, but that's the type of things people look for. So, so you've, got, you've got different types of false flags. You've got... Synthetic is, 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 is a way to describe it really happened, but there were, there were forces in there letting it happen. Is this kind of like the idea of, of purposefully focusing people on a particular news story because you want them to vote a certain way or do a certain thing? A synthetic no, event. Why don't I make, when you hear objection, you have to stop. Objection. Sustain. Give us another example of how that would work. Well, take that clip earlier today of the air. At the beginning of the clip, I say I, I believe Scarlett Lewis is, is real. I believe her son died. I'm very, very sorry. And they cut that off the front. And then they cut me saying I'm sorry off the end. And they brought a real clip, but it's synthetic, to try to deceive you. And I hope you get to see the real clip. And then you'll figure out everything else that's been going on. Let's go back to InfoWars and its business model. Um, do you sell vitamins? Yes. Are your vitamins FDA certified? No, they're not. Why not? 1996 law, the FDA has no jurisdiction over any nutraceuticals, not the ones at Whole Foods, not the ones at GNC, and not ours. And ours are private labeled, top brands that are sold at Whole Foods and GNC. We have them made by <laughs> the top lab recognized in the United States all we do is put our label on it so we know it's triple tested, the highest quality, and that's why people love it because it is the best out there. And I'll give it to Whole Foods, and I'll give it to GNC and others. They've got the same stuff. There's all sorts of crap you can buy at a gas station out there. That's not what ours is. I mean, we buy our PQQ and, and CoQ10 from the Japanese. I mean, it's the best. It costs five times what synthetic PQQ and CoQ10 cost. Ms. Uh, Karpova was asked about plaintiff's exhibit 35, which is in evidence. <laughs> Looks like some type of sales log. And can you tell us what year it begins in? Uh, looks like uh, September 2015. And can you flip to the last page and tell us what year it ends in? It ends in December 2018. If you flip back to the front, can you see the headings? Yes. Can you see the column that... Are you all right? Yeah. Don't worry, it's not COVID. It's a torn larynx. <coughs> sorry, go ahead. Sorry, we're sorry. Go ahead. There is a uh, column that is labeled invoice. Uh -huh. Yes. Would that represent gross sales? I believe so. And let's flip to the last page, and you can tell us what the gross sales number is. 165230000 Can you tell the members of the jury how much of that represents profit versus
versus just gross revenue? The, it depends on what product it is. Some products make 20%, some products make 60%. Like on a book, you know, you might be 20, 30% on food is that, and that's the biggest type things. Um, on supplements, if they're on sale, you make 50% of it. If it's not on sale, uh, you make you know, more than that, sometimes 100% markup, uh, but usually it's on sale. So it, it, it really all depends. I can tell you bottom line numbers, though, uh, of, of how much money I've been paid, things like that, or how much money's there. Before we, we discuss that, let's, um, let's talk about InfoWars, the organization. Would you describe it as organized or chaotic? It's a mix of both, but it is the opposite of corporate, and there's no corporate culture, and there's no, um, people are very happy there overall, and it's very, very diverse, and people stay there a long time, and, but, but I would say the sales department and, and, the, and the shopping cart, that's in another building, it's not even there, and it's kind of like, two groups that don't really talk to each other. So the disorganization is between people that do production and the people that do the sales in the warehouse and stuff, and we're trying to get that integrated. But Let me, maybe this is an easier way to go after it. Let's discuss, for example, email. How much email does InfoWars routinely get? I, I, mean, I, I mean, I know when we look to comply with the discovery, which we comply with, it was over 10 million that they had a search that was still in the inbox unopened. So it was 10 million unopened and a few hundred thousand opened. And uh, that's why there's a lot of stuff we never saw because it was in the 10 million emails. So about how much email would you say you get on a given day just sent by random people? I can't answer that because about 10 years ago I got rid of my email address because it was getting 20,000 a day. And so that's that's that was one of the things they didn't believe there wasn't an Alex in Infowars because like, well of course you got an email I'm like no I don't uh, and uh, that's like it doesn't exist because I can't read that it's just I can't read twenty thousand emails. How many employees would Infowars have to have, in your view, if you were to actually read every message, every email, every tip that's sent in? It would take 10, 15, 20 people. We go bankrupt, which we are now, but. Going back to, I want to ask you a question. There's a, a term that's been thrown around um, during this trial of, of the truther community or truth people. Um, what does that? I have a couple of questions I'm going to need to take up outside the presence of the jury. I don't know if you want to do that now or which we've done with the jury. That really depends on you, Mr. Bingston, whether you think I need to hear them now or later. I'm, I'm worried they need to be heard contemporaneously, so I'd like to hear them. All right. Um, we're going to just just sit tight for a second. We're going to take a break. I don't know if it will eat up the rest of the afternoon or not, so I'm not going to release you in case it doesn't. I want to not waste any time. Um, and so I'll send someone back if you're going to go or if you're going to come back. Remember all of my instructions. On the chance that I don't see you before tomorrow, please arrive at 845 like normal for us to get started. All right. Thank you. All right. All right, Mr. Jones, you can go back down to council table. Everyone may be seated. All right, Mr. Bankston. I don't know what's going on, Your Honor, but I need to bring a couple of motions there for jury instructions, and then I'm going to go ahead and bring a motion for sanctions right now on the record. I know you don't want to hear it from the end of the trial, but the jury instructions are pending now. Right. Um, we have, as you know, there's been a pattern of Mr. Reynolds blatantly violating MIOs and court rules. Um, it, it, Mr. Reynolds just absolutely solicited direct testimony from Mr. Jones that he is bankrupt. Mr. Jones has testified straight into the record that he's bankrupt. Which is not true, which is a sham that's going on right now, which Mr. Jones pulled $60 million out of his company out of here. But the most important part, Your Honor, is you have a, fan, you have a motion limiting entered in this case that is in no uncertain terms. 
that they cannot, due to violating your orders repeatedly to provide networks information, they cannot apply evidence of network. Mr. Jones just intentionally did that, in violation of your order, to attempt to poison this convinced during damage verdict, to try to tell this jury that he's broke when he's not. And that's in violation of your order. And Mr. Randolph drew that right out of him, totally expecting that to happen. It was very obvious from the question he asked, once Mr. Jones tell this jury he's broke. That is ridiculous. The second is that he absolutely, Mr. Jones just fully testified that we complied with discovery. I am under the standing MIO, not permitted to mention discovery disputes. But we both know Mr. Jones did anything but comply with discovery and did that for four years, thumbing his nose in the face of this court in rank contempt. There needs to be an instruction to the jury that he did not comply with discovery, that materials that were repeatedly ordered by this court will not turn over. Some of that includes his net worth information. And you were, I also would like an instruction to the jury to disregard and strike his comments that about him being bankrupt, which they are to take as having no evidentiary value and is not true. Uh, otherwise, I am deeply prejudiced going forward. The other thing that Mr. Jones testified to is that he doesn't, doesn't communicate by email, doesn't have emails to turn over. You know from a motion for sanctions that involved defendants' former counsel tampering with evidence that they tampered with a piece of evidence to hide the fact from me that Mr. Jones does have an email and was communicating with him. To this date, we still don't know what that email is. We don't know, I haven't been produced any of it, but Mr. Jones is just repeatedly lying on the stand in ways that I cannot counter because they deal with your discovery rules. Um, I want the jury to be instructed to disregard all of that testimony, that, that it has been already found by the court that Mr. Jones does have an email, that he did not turn those emails over, and did not admit and denied the existence of that email, that he did not comply with discovery, that he is not bankrupt and the jury is not to consider him. Additionally, on top of those instructions, we are now formally moving for sanctions against both Mr. Jones and Mr. Raynal, who we believe intentionally solicited testimony to sabotage this jury. And I would not normally make that accusation so openly against a fellow attorney had that attorney not continually violated rules of this court on every single day, including before putting Mr. Jones on, clearly attempting to solicit from a witness an attorney-client communication earlier into this day, which, as we've seen him violate rules that a first-year law student should know, a first-day law student should know not to ask the plaintiff about her communications with counsel. This is absolutely in bad faith. Therefore, we'd like jury instructions and we're filing a motion for sanctions. Little Mark not only wants Jones sanctioned, he wants his lawyer to go down, too. What a petty little bastard. Let's just listen to that question again. How many employees would InfoWars have to have, in your view, if you were to actually read every message, every email, every tip that's sent in? It would take 10, 15, 20 people we go bankrupt, which we are now. But. What he said was, we would go bankrupt, which we are now. It could just as easily have meant, we're going bankrupt. That isn't the same as saying, we are bankrupt. Also, if Jones didn't cooperate with Discovery, what's with the countless depositions, emails, videos, and all this other evidence? How did they beat Jones so badly without Jones's cooperation with Discovery? Was it the default ruling that took place before the trial? Or maybe it was the completely biased judge. Who knows, man? Regardless, these people are expecting $2.75 trillion for payment which is the stupidest number I've ever heard. I mean, come on, man, I'm trying my absolute best to kill our economy, but I can't do it that fast, man. Be patient. Would you like to respond, Mr. Raymond? If Your Honor thinks it necessary, I will. I think that Your Honor can review the transcript of my questions. I don't think my questions elicited that testimony. Uh, I'm sorry that that came out. I don't think that there was anything I could have done in my questioning uh, that that would have prevented it from happening. I know that Your Honor has contemporaneous transcript and can look it over. So I, I would urge you to do so um, because I, you know, I'm sorry it happened. I tried to move on very, very quickly. I think Your Honor saw me raise my hand, um, but I can only ask the questions. Let me ask Mr. Jones a couple of questions while you're under oath. Yes, Stan. What did? your attorney tell you about your testimony today not I, mean, I want to be very careful um were you instructed that there were some things you could not testify about yes 
And do you remember what they were? Yes. And what were they? Just top level. I'm trying to remember that first there was a document you put out saying don't talk about free speech, don't uh, don't say I'm innocent, uh, and, and, and a bunch of other stuff, and then and then that got withdrawn. You, I believe you withdrew it. I think it's called motion and limiting. Okay. So you don't remember? No, no, no. I, I, no. I, I remember currently. Stop. Uh, <laughs> remember day one where I said it's an unfair world and you don't get to interrupt the judge? Do you sure, remember that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. But the judge gets to interrupt you. Okay. Remember that? Yeah. Um, okay. So you don't really remember what you were not supposed to testify about. That's what I'm hearing. You said, yes, I remember. No, I don't remember. Well, let me. I'm trying to remember. Okay. Um, I don't want you to try and remember. No, I, I, I don't want things. you to try and remember. You either knew or you don't. Um, I remember him saying, "Don't talk about, don't talk about the financial stuff or something like that." Like a week ago, when I asked him, and then I remember today watching part of Heslin's testimony when I was coming here and him talking about the bankruptcy. So I thought that was totally fine. I mean, he gets to why do I not get to do what he gets to do? Mr. Jones, yeah. stop making, just stop. Okay. All right, um, you can sit down, Mr. Jones. Okay. Do you have any reply, Mr. Bankson? Uh, not really. And actually, to... before I hear from you, you know whose obligation it is, Mr. Raynal, to make sure that any witness you put forward understands the orders in limine, understands what he is not allowed to say because of orders that I have made before now, right? As an attorney, it's an impossible position. That wasn't to be the question in. I asked you. I would. I know that it is my obligation to communicate your honor's orders. Beyond that, I. I think that's all I need to say. You know, the only thing I was saying, I actually probably do need to ask for an additional jury instruction uh, during the same testimony, and the reason why I do not believe that Mr. Raynal was keeping a tight leash on this client for MIL and why I do believe he was intentionally trying to violate them is Mr. Raynal had a long series of questions about whether Mr. Jones is a pundit who merely gives his opinion, does not provide facts, was not stating facts, was only giving his opinion. That's another one of your motion and limine, that the defendants cannot contest in this case that the statements that they were giving were merely protected opinions and not statements of fact. That all came out intentionally for Mr. Raynal, and you know too through the rest of this testimony that he's been intentionally trying to drive out the viability sections of your MIO. As we said yesterday, we think he's intentionally trying for a mistrial. And if, and if, if it, it really is a matter of, oh, whoops, I guess I forgot to remind my client not to suddenly blurt out to the jury that he's broke on the day when he was screaming that he's going to do it, right? When he says, I'm going to come in there and I'm, this judge ain't going to hold me down, it's going to be her Waterloo. And then he comes in here and do that. Maybe we'd forgive, forgive it if he wasn't also asking questions that were directly in violation of motion. And Your Honor, we believe this is just egregious. Your Honor, if All I right. may on that point, just on that point, um, Your Honor has ruled already that during this phase of the trial, we are to discuss and and I, over my objection all the issues raised by Rule Forty One Eleven. I've been objecting to that. Except I, net worth. Well, except net worth. And within that, for the jury to make an accurate determination, you need to talk about intent. You need to talk about degree of malice. You need to talk about how extreme the behavior was or wasn't. And so the testimony I'm eliciting, which I believe, I, I've never said, nor has my client said, that your honor's ruling shouldn't stand. But in order for the jury to be able to make a decision, they need to know the entire context and they need to understand the mental state of the participants because if not they can't render well, a ruling on the punitive problem damages. is and you know this and we've already had this conversation multiple times in this trial in addition to it before this trial the time for that was during discovery when mr jones chose not to fully participate it is not the time to do that now. If there is anything that he would like to put forth as a defense, he needed to do it a year ago during the discovery process. It's too late now. And when you ask questions that imply 
or outright say that he didn't know how to be a journalist or he wasn't a journalist, you're calling into question my ruling, which was based on a long-standing principle in the law, that if you intentionally, repeatedly, and over years, in this case, again and again, refuse to participate in discovery, that is proof that you do not have a meritorious defense. That was the basis of my ruling. You cannot attack that in this trial. For motions to, for sanctions, you've got to write them down. They're under advisement until they're written down and filed. We'll take that up post-trial. Your Honor, so that I don't run afoul of your ruling. I'm not done. I'm sorry. You don't even know what it is yet. For the motions seeking sanctions against Mr. Jones and Mr. Raynal, you have to write those down. They have to be filed with the court. I'll take them up post-trial. That may mean during deliberations. That may mean later in August. I don't know. Assume it'll be as soon as I have time. So file a response if you want to. Mr. Jones, you may not say to this jury that you complied with discovery. That is not true. You may not say it again. You may not tell this jury that you are bankrupt. That is also not true. You may have filed for bankruptcy. I don't know that, but I've heard that. That doesn't, put, that doesn't make a person or a company bankrupt. You're already under oath to tell the truth. You've already violated that oath twice today in just those two examples. It seems absurd to instruct you again that you must tell the truth while you testify, yet here I am. You must tell the truth while you testify. This is not your show. You need to slow down and not take what you see as opportunities to to make a defense further the message you're wanting to further and instead only answer the specific and exact question you have been asked no asides the comments about discovery the comments about the larynx or whatever it was the comments about bankruptcy none of those were responsive to questions they were just you abusing my tolerance and making asides to the jury improperly and in at least two cases untruthfully do you understand what i have said yes or no do you understand what i have said yes i believe what i said was true so I don't yes you believe everything you say is true but it isn't your beliefs do not make something true that is that is what we're doing here just because you claim to think something is true does not make it true. It does not protect you. It is not allowed. You are under oath. That means things must actually be true when you say them. Don't talk. She did just call him a liar, though. You understand what I have said. I do understand. You understand the instructions I have given you for your testimony in court. Yes. I'm not going to bring the jury back today. My staff is listening. They can let the jury go home. We'll start back up tomorrow. When you come back to testify tomorrow, one more time, no asides. Do you understand what I mean when I say no asides? Yes. Answer only the question asked of you. Do you understand what I mean when I say only answer the question asked of you? Yes. You understand you will still be under oath when you return tomorrow morning to yes. complete your testimony. All right. And you understand that that means you must only testify about things that are true. To the best of my knowledge. If you don't know something, you don't say it. If you're asked about your opinion, you can give your opinion. 
But if you're asked to relate something that's <laughs> truthful and a fact, it must be truthful and a fact. Not an assumption, not a guess, not an opinion. Do you understand? Yes. All right. You can sit down. Anything else? Yes, sir. Just so that I can make sure that I don't run afoul of your Honor's motion in limine or earlier rules. Just to be clear, we call them motions. I don't issue motions. I issue orders. These are orders in limine and have been ordered since before this trial started. Is your Honor ordering me not to explore the nature of the law? That is very broad. <laughs> the character of the conduct involved. You may not elicit testimony designed to leave the jury with the impression that Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems did not defame Mr. Heslin or that Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems did not engage in the intentional infliction of emotional distress against Ms. Lewis and Mr. Heslin. May I elicit evidence as to the low degree of culpability that should be ascribed to free speech systems and to Alex Jones by virtue of his education, his situation, the situation at InfoWars, uh, and what was going on? So Mr. Jones was too ignorant to know that he was lying? Is that your defense? Your Honor, my defense is for the jury, not for the court. Uh, I'm asking whether I can elicit testimony as to uh, his mental state, to the organization of the company, to the standard practices in his industry, um, to uh, what was going on in his personal life, um, all to illustrate the low degree of culpability that should be attributed to his company. You can ask Mr. Jones questions about, similar to some of the questions or all the questions that were allowed um, when Ms. Karpova was on the stand, that kind of touch on these same areas that were allowed. I think those are fair game. Um, you can ask him I mean, I think the answer is yes, as long as you're very careful. Very well. Anything else from you, Mr. Reynolds? No. Anything else from you, uh, Mr. The Manson? only thing is I wanted to confirm with you that, that we'll be, tomorrow morning we'll be taking up whether there will be instructions and should I propose instructions to the court? Yes, please propose the exact instruction you would like me to give. I think it would be appropriate to give those instructions, if any, before Mr. Jones retakes the stand. Um, yeah. One second, please. I think we need something. We need some instruction. So you can do it the way you did the proposed charge instructions. You can both send my office an email if you would like to. Yes, Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Jones would like to say something that's directly relevant to what we've been discussing. I, I am not very briefly your honor I think it's important for for my I, candor towards the court that you okay. hear what he has to say I I'm I am not typically in the practice <coughs> of hearing from parties except when they are on the stand and I don't see a reason to change that practice any more than I already have I would this is simply in line with your honor's question as to what he was instructed in terms of what he should testify about. it doesn't matter at this stage I expect that you will go over the instructions as you are required to do under the rules and I'm gonna leave it there anything else nothing I'll show from either of you attorneys okay all right, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. All right. So I don't know exactly what type of defense Jones and his lawyer are expected to use in this trial because every defense imaginable has been predetermined to be off limits or out of bounds. As the court disassembled, Ms. Lewis suddenly approached Jones and then this happened. Sure.
Apparently being nice to Heslin and Lewis is where this guy draws the line. This trial is a fucking joke, but I'll be back with the rest of Jones's testimony as soon as it's ready. But for now, I've got to go. This diaper just can't take any more punishment. But I tell you what, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go to bed. Thank you. Thanks for watching.